where do you see Docker and AI come together? What is that inflection point that you see? Well, there's a number of there's a number of different things. I mean, first of all, like you know, almost all our customers are using AI with contain with Docker with containers right now. Um, but it's it's not that easy necessarily. I mean, it's a like the you know the container ecosystem was built around CPUs, not GPUs, and while there's been support for a long time, it's still kind of messy and. Um, so there's still work to do to just make it easier, help people. Like there's all these people who are, you know, doing AI for the first time. They weren't data, they're not data scientists. They're just people who are suddenly interested in solving a problem with AI who would never have even thought about it before. So there's a lot of newcomers into the space, okay. trying to understand how to do things. And you know, a lot of you know, I people using Docker are just going to use use Docker for doing this, and so we. And we've done things like we had a Gen AI stack, which is a rag stack example that we open source released Docker on as a way of you know helping people learn what it looks like to structure one of these applications and what you know what how to think about it, what it might look like, so you can just play around with it and with your data and work out what works for you. Because it's rag's a pretty common pattern. Okay. And um, we're looking to extend you know, extend that. But um, you know, also like Working, working on with people on Docker Hub to get images there. Working on like, like better documentation. Like, we're doing a bunch of work on um, WebGPU as well, which is a browser standard for talking to GPUs, which is very portable. And we're building an interface so you can use that in containers. So that because one of the problems is that like developers want to access a GPU. It's, it's hard to it's hard to get something from Nvidia right now because there's a shortage and they're expensive. But you've usually got a GPU in your laptop of some sort, but it might not be in an Nvidia one. It might be you might have an Apple machine or whatever. So there's a lack of standardization around that. So we've been kind of working on that as one one route towards standardizing. We've also been working with Alama, who have got a runtime for local GPU operations as well. Okay. So now that you mentioned that, you made me curious about the Docker engine and any additions or with it, whether it's within the engine or around the engine that make integrations with uh, specific devices, like you mentioned GPU, NVIDIA, that's where like most people use today. But we know that the Intel GPUs are up and coming, the AMD GPUs are also you know, making some nice progress. But there's also like other specialist devices, like very specialized networking cards. Is there something that the yeah. Docker ecosystem that bridges all these there's, special devices? I mean, there's a there's a, a fair amount of work. There's a there's a there's CDI, a container device interface, and Container D, which is a more generic device setup and handling interface, which is um, makes things a bit easier. I mean, the ecosystem is very kind of fragmented, like. NVIDIA has built this big moat with CUDA, um, which has been great because CUDA is a great piece of software. It works really well, but it does not work with Intel or AMD. People who are writing software have to support different backends for lots of different things. And there, there is a kind of, there's some work on building these abstraction, generic abstraction layers. I mean, I think WebGPU is an interesting one because it abstracts at the, at the kind of standard GPU coding thing as you'd use for programming like games and graphics it's like that level it's very similar to metal and those types of APIs it's a kind of classic modern API but actually language models are much, actually much simpler in the way they use hardware um, and there's there's really interesting projects like TinyGrad where they you know they have a set of 11 operations which is all you need to build LLMs on, and there's a few other people with similar kind of really small stacks. Like we've just got some tensor operations and load it in a tensor matrix, and then you can just JIT compile those. And that's a much simpler API. That's kind of an interesting point because being told you have to code for 11 operations is much easier than building a whole ecosystem like CUDA. Yeah, and so it's actually like for the, for the AI applications, it's looks like we can have a, actually a simpler stack, potentially, that's easier to port. But we need 
we need a pluggable abstraction <laughs> layer at that point so you can plug Got plug it. different backends in easily. And it's it's still a little unclear where you know what the abstraction boundaries are really going to look like. So it's hard to know how to help with those things. At the moment, generally, people are bundling a lot of different backends into their containers. So, you know, with very large containers, or they're just coding for just for NVIDIA. Um, and so, you know, there's, it's adds a lot of complexity to actually building a building and testing a stack. Yeah. For, for the you know, if you if you want to ship something, you have to do all this work to put all the backends, ship on different these different things, test and support on them, which is you know hard work. Okay, okay. So if we step a little bit away from the whole AI buzz, yeah. what else is out there? What else is you think is interesting for you when you look at the ecosystem, the Docker ecosystem, and everything else that plugs into the Docker ecosystem? Yeah, I mean we we. we been spending a bunch of time actually building hybrid tools where you can work as if you're on your laptop, but actually do things in the cloud. So, um, so we have Docker Build Cloud, Test Containers Cloud, uh, uh, all the work on that model that you can just do a Docker build, but actually it's happening in the cloud much much faster than it would be on your laptop, but and maybe on different hardware. Maybe you need a GPU. Maybe you're on an ARM Mac and you want to build an Intel application, so you want to do it natively rather than using emulation. But totally transparently, you just t turn the switch on and it is in the cloud, and it's, you don't have to change the way you work. Because it's been it's been really interesting to look at, like you know, some people want their developers to work in the cloud fully in a you know just spin up a browser and that's your editor and endpoint to everything. But it's been really, a lot of developers don't want to work like that. They love their local setups. Okay. And it's still, so we're kind of, we've been experimenting with this sort of hybrid idea just to let people kind of mix and match the way they want to work and not force them into one, one thing or the other. I mean, it's, it's really interesting how developers are Real tool building animals, you know, they love to make tools love to build, all the time. Love to build. And, and your kind of laptop is an expression of, uh, you know, the environment that you've built up yourself to work in. Yeah. And it feels like there's a sense of pride in how you build your tools and how you set them up and an obsession sometimes. And yeah. We have whole Slack channels internally talking about tools Got it. people use. And okay. so, so, yeah. And, and also, partly, I mean, it's interesting with. You know, Apple is Apple both with the M1 originally and now with like in the AI era of like with their GPUs and their unified memory architecture. Like they, you can get huge, really performant laptops. And so there's kind of people that you know, like you can get a you know 128 gig of RAM in a laptop from Apple now because people want to run AI models. And so it's pushing a, a new one. era of high I performance. I need one too. Yes, yeah. that's exactly what you mean. I mean, it's it's actually really. I mean, I think in a few years when the when the GPU shortage is over, we're going to have really a lot of more performance, a lot of I/O bandwidth going into these things, a lot of memory bandwidth. And it's actually, you know, it's a sort of trickle down into how you can the kind of applications you'll be able to build is actually really exciting. Um, you know, really ridiculously fast. Yeah, like even now, and they're like moving. You know, there's been a huge investment in. A lot in I/O memory bandwidth because that's the real constraint, really. And 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 even like a few years ago, people started using GPUs for doing things like uh, database query because it's easy to vectorize. It's worth doing if you're, you know, and, and also using machine learning to do program optimization and things like that. So there's more and more use cases for this hardware. There's, there's going to be knock-on effects just from the fact that this hardware will be there. It'll be much cheaper in a few years. Yeah. And, um, it'll be quite an exciting time, I think, yeah. to build new things. As we talk about that, I'm wondering, how do you see WebAssembly and WASM, the role that it plays in this future where we have a lot of very powerful hardware sitting on our desks, and all of a sudden, there's a lot that's moving in our browser, there's a lot that's moving locally, so right now we see we have to go to the cloud to get that performance. And I think networks will still be a problem, right? Like no one has a 10 gigabit 
you know, WAN at home. Some people do. In Switzerland, I believe. Okay, right, right. Yeah, that's the place to be. That's yeah. the place to be. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. South Korea. I don't. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's the place to be. So maybe, yeah, in a few years we'll be there. But when you think about WebAssembly and WASM and the role that it plays, um, how do you see that in the whole mix, right? That's Docker, AI, GPUs, it's really powerful local machines. How, how, how do you see that play out? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I, mean, I think the, the rich browser applications it's enabled are amazing. Things like Figma and things like they, they're built, they couldn't have been built without WASM. Um, and I think that enabling, I, I think it's really exciting that we, we can enable developers to write those kind of applications without having to throw everything they know away and rewrite it in JavaScript and things like that. that that's, like, that's really been impactful. The other use cases of WASM are still, a lot of them are still trying to find their, find their real use cases. There's, there's a whole bunch of different use cases that are kind of interesting. I mean, the, the WASM plugins for you know, like Envoy and things are, are kind of, it's a, it's a good, I used to work in the Lua ecosystem, which was the other one. Well, a lot of people built plugins in, and it's a, uh, you know, and I think Wasm gives you more flexibility there, and um, like, there's a lot of people. I uh, Shopify uh, doing a lot of work there, and people, uh, like, there's a lot of, where you ha and you can have very fast. You know, Shopify have these cases where they have extremely low latency requirements because the stuff's happening in your shopping cart, and you don't want it to be delayed. <laughs> um, got it. So, so there's kind of use cases like that. I'm I'm quite interested in the, I mean, from the security point of view, the, the whole use case of um, sandboxing library code that you use. Like, there was a bunch of work in JavaScript a few years ago, but it was people had to actively adopt it, and it was kind of it took it was kind of niche. But you know, I, I have a library that I'm using to um, compute something. I don't. I want to be able to not give it network access because. I don't want it to exfiltrate the data it's computing with. So I just, if it can't access the network, that's great. Whereas currently libraries just tend to have the same scope as the rest of the application, and it's hard to do that. But got it. With the uh, with with Wasm, I think that, that, you know there's this idea that you can run libraries in with a Wasm runtime that can be, and they don't even have to be written in the same language. So it's like people can write libra libraries for your Python use case in Rust, so I mean, Python does a lot of that with C libraries, and like you know, a lot of a lot of Python is talking to other libraries like that. But a lot of other language ecosystems haven't really done that. And I think that those use cases are really interesting. Um, and then there's yeah, there's Wasm as a server language. Is. It's, again, it's, it's trying to find its use cases. There's a lot of interest in Edge. Some of the AI use cases are kind of interesting for the compute path, but it's not a it's not a GPU focused language, so so not for the other not for those parts. But I, I, you know, I think there's a you know it's st still it's still searching for some of those use cases. But there's um, I think that I mean people sort of say it replaces containers, which I don't think is true. They're, there's a bunch of similarities in some ways if you sort of squint, but like the things that we built for the container ecosystem and the way that containers work is something that every future ecosystem is going to have. Like the, the, those patterns were really successful and added a real lot of value that we didn't have before before Docker. And you're not going to build a new ecosystem that doesn't use those same patterns. We've been supporting Wasm as a citizen on the platform to be able to explore with, but like, you know, treating it in the same way. Like, it's got different properties, it's got different portability, but it's, you know, it's still that kind of packaging and metadata thing and containers is actually really valuable. Got it. Okay. That was a very good answer. Thank you very much yeah. for that. Like, there were many things you haven't even thought about, and you pointed them out, so thank you. As we think about KubeCon and the event and this specific one, is there anything that you will do differently as a result of you being here? Like, did you maybe attend a talk or were you part of a conversation that changed your perspective on something? Um, I mean, I think that, I mean, every, every time I come to KubeCon, it reinforces the, the, the community. I, you know, I can't walk across this room without 
running into so many people I know, catching up with what they're working on, finding out where their projects are at. It's like that, you know, the, the ecosystem has been amazing. The Docker really kind of started originally around the, our community of containers and then the, the broader kind of Kubernetes ecosystem around that. And it's, um, and it's you know, it's bigger, bigger than ever and stronger. And I think that, and there's so much work going on. We, you know, the amount of collaboration that goes on isn't always visible to people from the outside. We launched um, Desk Containers Cloud on Red Hat OpenShift. People think that we don't work with Red Hat. We actually do a lot of work with Red Hat. But it's a lot, not always as visible as that kind of thing. But it's like we're, we're, we're actually working with them a lot because we're all part of this ecosystem. And, and the ecosystem is successful because of open, open standards and open technology and sharing of ideas. And it lets people build new things, explore. People are pivoting. I, I caught up with um, Acorn, the extra people who have pivoted to their um, GPT script project from the Kubernetes based stuff, which is um, talk, to, talk to them about that. I uh, talked to Solomon about Dagger yesterday. Like, Dagger's so, so suddenly become a lot easier for people to understand. And so it's suddenly like there's a lot, there's a lot of interest suddenly because it's, they can see where, where it's going now because it's got, it's got the functions bit on top that makes it, oh, I, I can try that out. It's like makes, makes so much more sense to people than it, it was. It's hard to explain a year ago. So it's those kind of things that you see when you come and like, um, you know, learn about, learn, learn where people are, understand their things, catch up with the people you should have caught up with in between keep guns but didn't. <laughs> Thank you. That was very, very good. Thank you, Justin. I enjoyed this very, very much. Great to meet you. Great I'm looking to you. forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you.